This is a bridge episode. Watch to the end to learn what I mean by that. Today's video is primarily focused on written forms of storytelling. Short stories, novels, novellas, poetry, and so on. The reason is because audio media is usually a verbalized version of written media, so it counts anyway, and visual media is generally going to be in third person. The obvious objection would be Hardcore Henry, but I haven't seen it, so I won't comment on it other than it's clearly an experimental form and not the rule. Regardless, we are talking about points of view or POVs today. Just to prevent this discussion from going straight into the deep end of theory, I will only be talking about all of this in terms of written media. So let's just jump into it. To start off with, there are three generalized POVs of first, second, and third person. They are each subdivided into limited and omniscient versions. Limited means the reader only has access to the information available to the character at hand, and omniscient means the reader has access to all of the information available to the story up to that moment. In other words, in any limited perspective, you have the observations and thoughts of the POV character. In an omniscient perspective, you have the observations and thoughts of all characters. Further complicating the matter is the existence of reliable and unreliable narrators, but let's not jump into that yet. Unless I specifically say so, assume I am always referring to a reliable narrator. Something you absolutely need to know immediately is that you should never change the POV during the story. There are plenty of exceptions where it works, but you risk completely ruining the experience of the reader, so avoid doing it, unless you are absolutely certain it serves the story. Common examples of breaking the rule would be a prologue, epilogue, or even an interlude. You can flip-flop between narrators, but if you're still inexperienced, I highly recommend you hold off until you have a few years of serious writing under your belt. Two or more narrators can quickly spiral a story out of control for you and mess up the reader's experience. We are going to start with third-person omniscient. The reason is because, for most of the recognizable periods of literature, this has been the norm. The way it works is that the story is written in the perspective of a third-person narrator who sees and knows everything important to the story. Think of the following paragraph as an example. Jane crept down the stairs and tried to convince herself that the noise she heard was nothing more than her old house shifting in the nighttime breeze. Jack held his breath in the closet underneath and cursed the floorboards for giving him away. He watched the gap under the door grow brighter as Jane rounded the corner of the stairs with her light. What makes this third person omniscient? Well, the narration is not coming from any character inside of the paragraph, so the reader feels as if they're looking into a scene from the outside. Additionally, the internal thoughts of more than one character was available to the reader, so the perspective is not limited to just one character's experience. The appeal to writing in third-person omniscient is that it allows the writer to basically just tell the story with no real restrictions whatsoever. The narrator is disconnected so they can see anything and be anywhere. The writer can keep characters at an arm's length away to avoid needing to portray the interiority of emotions they themselves might be inexperienced with, and if something starts to become seemingly uninteresting, the writer can add things known by other characters. However, there are major downsides, and they are the reason third-person omniscient is mostly out of vogue. Sure, it's likely many authors still use it, but it's definitely rare to see it become popular these days. The first downside is the disconnect itself. Readers want to experience the story through a character, so merely recounting what the characters are doing from afar can be disappointing. The second downside is that tension is really difficult to maintain in any omniscient system, but especially third person. If the reader knows the general status of everyone in a scene, then a lot of the potential for tension has been nullified. The result of all of this, plus the time period when it was popular, is that third-person omniscient is primarily found in literary fiction. For the uninitiated, that's the fiction that a lot of people say is not only outside of genre fiction, but above it. I disagree, but that's not today's topic, so let's just move on. Third Person Limited addresses a lot of the concerns I mentioned about the previous one. Remember my last example and compare it to this paragraph. Jane crept down the stairs and tried to convince herself that the noise she heard was nothing more than her old house shifting in the nighttime breeze. She ignored the part of her that knew she would have stayed upstairs if she really believed that, as well as the part that knew the creaks of her own steps were identical to the ones she heard. She peered in the darkness beyond her light as she neared the closet door. 
as you may have noticed, we are still in third person because we are still outside of Jane. But this time, we are in a limited perspective. We only observe and know what Jane observes and knows. It gives us more space to have more from Jane, and the mystery of the noises is even more intense, because the reader has to learn alongside Jane. Some of you might argue that there is more tension in the first, because in that one, we know Jack is there, and it seems like he's the antagonist in this situation. But that's an artifact of this no-context example. Of course, there was a director who once explained that if you start with the camera on a bomb and pan out to a dinner party, that has more tension than just the dinner party, but that's another subject for not this video. And no, I'm not going to look up which director said that, because I really don't want to Google dinner party bomb. I'm off track. My point is, it should be self-evident why Third Person Limited is a lot more popular than Third Person Omniscient in recent years. You're closer to the protagonist, so you know and feel more about them. The narrative feels less disjointed, and there's more room for depth instead of breadth. Next, we are going into first-person perspective. If you've been reading contemporary fiction, you would have noticed that First Person Limited is pretty much the standard right now. Crack open a copy of The New Yorker on a work of fiction, and statistically, it's written in First Person Limited. Let's look at an example. I crept down the stairs. The house is old, it creaks sometimes. I didn't believe it. I wouldn't come down here if I did. Besides, the boards under my own feet sounded exactly what I heard just a minute before. My light didn't go very far, and I could barely make out the door to the closet. As you can tell, it pops you right into the head of the protagonist. If you've ever taken a literature class before, someone is inevitably telling the professor that they like the story because it, quote, feels like they are telling us the story personally, end of quote. The professor will nod and say that's a great observation. This exchange is even more likely if it's written in a very casual dialect with intentionally bad grammar. The obvious benefit to First Person Limited is that it automatically boosts character development of the protagonist when it's done right. You immediately know who the protagonist is as a person when you read their experience from their perspective. You see the world around them through their eyes. You know the other characters based on their relation to the protagonist. You feel the struggles through the protagonist's experience, etc. In other words, if you do First Person Limited right, the format itself will do a lot of work for you automatically. What matters enough to your character to develop with extra care? Well, what shows up in the story at all? The fact there are such strong benefits and no obvious downsides is probably why it's so common in contemporary fiction. But surely there are downsides, right? There are. I like to call them fake benefits because bad first person limited falls into a set of traps that amateur writers tend to be tricked by. I'm going to state each one as an exaggerated idea an amateur might think of as a solution. If one seems similar to something you're doing, then pay extra attention. I'm not here to criticize you, I'm here to make you a better writer. The first fake benefit is, oh, I don't like using grammar, so I'll just write in first person limited and say my mistakes are intentional. Contrary to what a lot of people entering creative writing might think, grammar is important. Language, in its most Fundamental form is all about communicating information efficiently and effectively from one person to another. Grammar is the set of rules a language follows to make sure the users know what everything means. Yes, First Person Limited can bend grammatical conventions for effect. However, the writer still needs to know what the actual rule is first and ensure the departure they are making is both intentional and does not create a misunderstanding. If you use First Person Limited as a method of getting away with using casual language, then it just comes across as if you don't know how to write. First Person Limited isn't an excuse. The second fake benefit is, oh, I'll just write in First Person Limited and say that all of my protagonists believe exactly what I believe so I can write about whatever I want, however I want. Characters are supposed to be their own persons. Even a self-insert character isn't you, but instead simply share features that you think you have. If your characters only exist to be mouthpieces of your rants, then your stories just become examples of your rants. And if your stories just become examples of your rants, then your worlds lose any sense of nuance. 
The tone and positions of first-person limited protagonists are supposed to be in service of the character, but they are not supposed to be taken as objective truths about the story or world. The third fake benefit is, oh, if I use first-person limited, I can add curse words to the narration too, instead of just dialogue. If you're an adult, this one should be self-evident. Non-character narrators, like those in third person, aren't usually going to curse just because cursing is a property of characters. So yes, a first person limited story is far more likely to include cursing and narration than third person. But remember, overdoing it doesn't make you seem mature, but instead gives an impression of trying to be edgy to a level that makes readers cringe. Side note, if you overdo cursing, whether in narration or even dialogue, and the story isn't accepted for publication, it's not because they were scandalized or they're too innocent. It's just that the story reads like a 12-year-old wrote it. Listen, I've said before, but I'm not here to tell you what you can and can't write. But I am here to give you advice and guidance in your writing journey. First Person Limited is a great tool in your tool belt. But if you only use it for one or more of these three reasons, then your writing will be unable to move forwards. Use First Person Limited if you want, but make sure you don't misuse it. If you've been keeping track, you will notice that I define the basic POVs as first, second, and third person with the additional values of limited and omniscient. That means there are six, but we've only done three. Yet, you might have realized these three make up a vast majority of fiction. The remaining three POVs are not going to be found in any conventional storytelling. Well, two of them at least. As such, there aren't any established hard rules with the next three. However, there are still conventions that exist, it's just that you are more likely to find ways around them without ruining a reader's experience. First Person Omniscient is... wacky. If you think back to Third Person Omniscient, remember how the thoughts and feelings of both characters are shown to the reader? First Person Omniscient does the same thing, but the narrator is in the story too. Off the top of my head, I cannot think of an example of a published work that uses this. In fact, the only example I can think of is a stage play of all things. Specifically, I went to a showing of Charles Dickens's A Christmas Carol. The production made the decision to have an omniscient narrator who actively participated in the story while giving self-aware sides directly addressed at the audience. However, they weren't in every scene and they weren't the main character. Theoretically, a first-person omniscient narrator must be godlike in some way. After all, they know the inner thoughts and feelings of characters that exist on the same level as they do. A third-person narrator doesn't exist in their own story. First-person narrators do. Even if you have a character that is just really good at reading people, it would still be limited because they would still be relegated to only observing specific characters at specific times. Omniscient implies they always have the information they need at the moment, so I really hesitate to say a first-person omniscient narrator could just be a normal person. Still, compared to the next two, I think first-person omniscient is mechanically still conventional. It's a bit experimental because of how rare it is, but I can't imagine the story itself having to be all that different from first-person limited, which already has the option to be self-aware anyway. So if you do know an already published work in First Person Omniscient, please let me know in the comments. I want to know if I'm right in guessing that the story wouldn't be too off the wall, but instead just... unique. Next are the two variants of Second Person. Both will generally be considered experimental fiction, or at least unconventional. The reason is because Second Person as a whole does something neither First nor Third Person perspectives do, which is involve the reader in the story. Third person tells the reader what's going on. First person gives the reader a front seat view and can even break the fourth wall by referencing the reader if it chooses. Second person puts the reader in front of the fourth wall. The most basic form of it, that in all likelihood you've seen at least once, are those choose your own adventure books. You know, you read a page, it gives you options to choose at the bottom, and then you turn to that page for what you choose to continue the story. Unconventional, but not new. The reader has direct control over the plot, but the narrator isn't a character. If you play Dungeons & Dragons, it operates on the same principle. The Dungeon Master presents the players with a situation, but the Dungeon Master themselves are not a figure in the game's world. However, that's also why I consider these books to be games, and so they don't really count in our discussion here, but I'd regret it if I didn't at least mention them. I can imagine Second Person Limited being able to function in two ways. 
The first is that the narrator is not a character, but rather just combining a third-person narrator with the first-person experience. For example, you creep down the stairs and try to convince yourself that the noise you heard was nothing more than your old house shifting in the nighttime breeze. You ignore the part of you that knows you would have stayed upstairs if you really believed that, as well as the part that knows the creak of your own steps are identical to the ones you heard. You peer in the darkness beyond your light as you near the closet door. Notice how it is a word-for-word -word recreation of my third-person limited example, except you're also visualizing the scene from the protagonist's perspective, like first-person. The main difference is that I switch from past to present tense. There just is something that feels natural for a first-person narration to be of something in the past, even if just a second ago, and for a second-person narration to be in the present, because this is something that you are supposedly doing, but it's happening now because you don't remember doing it before. It's experimental because it hasn't been used in published work enough to really have its rules dialed in, but as you can tell, it's still not a massive stretch from more familiar forms of storytelling. The experimentation resides in the effects of making the reader the protagonist. There is the potential of giving a reader a stronger experience than even first person, but there's a catch. There are no safety barriers for the reader to hide behind, and that can be an issue. Think of the differences here. Jim slapped Vic. I slapped Vic. You slapped Vic. Swap the action slapped for whatever is the worst thing you can stomach imagining, and notice how for both third and first person perspectives, the reader is not implicated. Even first person involves an eye that the reader is merely observing. Only second person tells the reader that they are the ones to commit an action. Cool feature, but just remember, some readers will have personal trauma in their own real life past. If you want a story with a main character that does really heinous acts, don't be surprised if you get even fewer readers by making it second person. True, it's their decision to pick up the book, but it's equally their decision, and their right, to put it back down. Success needs strategy, and second person is very high risk, high reward. The other way second person limited can feasibly work is by making the narrator a character within the story alongside the reader. For example, a friend character or even a figment of the main character's imagination. The reader is still a character in the story, but you're being led by someone else in the story. Have I personally seen it? No. Is it possible? Absolutely. My only hesitation is that it might come across as gaslighty, but maybe that's helpful to your theme anyway. Second person omniscient is the most experimental out of all of the narrative points of view. In fact, I don't really know if there are very many established rules about it at all. Experimental fiction isn't really my thing, so I don't read second person omniscient stories, but my peers that do all say very similar things on the subject. However, I did note some commonalities. Second person omniscient narrators seem untrustworthy. A third person omniscient narrator isn't usually a character, so they don't usually have motives. A first person omniscient narrator has motives, but they serve the same eye you see from, so it's no threat to you as a reader. But a second person omniscient narrator does feel threatening or at least intimidating. They have motives, but they aren't yours. They know more in the story than you do. They say what you do. The effect is that your agency feels taken away from you, and the being who has it knows it. Sure, they might be ambivalent, but the mere fact they could be intentionally lying to you, personally, is enough to put a lot of readers on edge. Of course, as a writer, maybe that effect is helpful for you. But if you really want a narrator you want the reader to trust and is trustworthy, this might not be the POV for you. Overall, those are the six basic narrative POVs. Write the stories your writing style does the most justice to, and pick the narrative POV that makes your writing style the strongest. Remember at the very beginning of the video when I said this is a bridge episode? What I meant was that this is still a broad topic to explain in very basic terms, but episodes after this will be on specific topics. For example, I've done videos in this series on character development, plot development, world building, and now POVs, 
but future videos will be on specific subsets, like plots for specific genres, world building for specific genres. People seem to like the beginner friendly tone, so I'll keep that up, but future videos are going to be focused to specific items within writing. Feel free to leave suggestions for the videos you would like to see in the comments. The next video is going to be about text and subtext. Until then, keep writing.